We're going to be in John chapter 6. We'll go ahead and turn that to your copy of, uh, your copy of God's Word this morning. Go ahead and get there. You know, some of you are already there because you knew we were heading there. John chapter 6. You know, last week, uh, we got to about midway through uh, the, the Bread of Life discourse in John chapter 6. And uh, today we're going to pick up in verse 52. And so if you'll join me there. Oh, I thought I was getting background music. I like that. Uh, I was like, wow, I don't know if I'm getting background music. Uh, <laughs> uh, John chapter 6, verse 52. It says, The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate manna and, and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Verse 60, Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe, and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore I have said to you, then no one can come to me unless he has been grant, unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray today that we would have understanding. pray that it would <coughs> sink into our hearts, and Father, that it would give us what we need this week and in the weeks to come. For all this in Jesus' name. Now, when I was in school, there were a lot of things I was told to read that I will admit, I hope my English teachers never watch this, uh, that I probably really didn't read. Uh, and for a few of those, I had a little extra help. And uh, I have this thing right here. Some of you are really familiar with this thing. Now, either you use it or your kids used it. Now they just look it up on their phone and it's the same thing. A good old Cliff's Notes, right? Uh, you remember Cliff's Notes was designed to uh, take some literary work originally and, and help you walk through it together, which really meant for most of us we read that instead of the book, right? Uh, we went and got what we wanted. And the reason why is because reading Shakespeare, this is Romeo and Juliet that's on the screen, uh, reading Shakespeare for a lot of people is difficult. Reading Beowulf is difficult. Reading some of those great classics that we had to read, uh, they speak in language, even though it's English, it's not the same English we talk, right? Uh, that we talk. You hear how good my English is? Uh, you know, it, it just it was tough. And so we wanted to just get to the bottom line and say, what's this really all about? And we pulled out Cliff's notes, and we said, Cliff, just tell what was chapter one really about so I could write my paper on it or go into class and sound like I know something or whatever the case was, right? And Jesus has been in this discourse of being the bread of life, and what he's been saying, we've seen time and time again, is being, being misunderstood by the crowd, right? Is this idea of physical, literal bread and food that he's talking about. And Jesus, in this section that we just read, is about to give them the Cliff's Notes version of this whole thing and say, here's what I've been meaning this whole time. Here's, here's the bottom line. 
He's about to, to open up this message in such a way and that everyone there would hear and be able to um, understand where he's going with his message. And now, if you go back earlier in John chapter 6, uh, to verse 28, we realize that these folks who Jesus fed on the mountainside with the five uh, loaves and the two fish, they followed Jesus. And, and as Jesus is talking about this bread of life, in the very beginning, they tell us in verse 28 that they want it, right? Where do we, what do we do so that we may accomplish the works of God? In other words, saying, you know, what can we do to get this bread? We want eternal life. We want bread that doesn't end. Uh, you know, we want the, the benefits of God. And they kind of follow that thought until Jesus tells them that he is the bread of life. And he begins to unpack what that means. And it doesn't end up meaning what they had hoped it would mean, right? All of a sudden, he's not looking so valuable as a king. He's not looking so valuable as someone who's going to provide them breakfast that next morning, right? And for the days to come. And Jesus has really, through this bread of life discourse, he's, he's told them that he's, he's come down from heaven. And they argued with him. He said that he was the bread of life. They argued with him. Last week, he began this, this discussion about him being uh, flesh. And, and this week, he adds on uh, talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And we just read that they argued with him. And what we're finding is that the more that he reveals, the more they argue, uh, the more impossible this whole thing seems to be, even to the point to where this crowd would have been offended, would have seen this whole discussion as absurd before it's all over. See, one thing that helps us to understand uh, why these people in verse 66 uh, begin to leave Jesus is because Jews were taught in the Old Testament that eating, eating flesh and blood in it was a sin, right? It was unclean. So you didn't eat flesh and blood in it, you didn't drink it. And Genesis chapter 9, uh, for you hunters, especially Genesis chapter 9, should be bookmarked in your Bible as where God tells us that he's given us every living thing to eat. Uh, so when the Peter folks get all mad, you can say, God said do it. Uh, you know, but in verse 4 of that, God says, you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Uh, Leviticus 17 kind of gives us a better picture, uh, a little bit fuller picture of that. Uh, it says, I said to the children of Israel, you shall not eat the blood of any flesh, for the life of all flesh is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. So Jesus says here in this passage which we just read, eat my flesh and drink my blood, the Jews are thinking, uh-uh, that's, that's craziness. That's unclean. That's disgusting. That's nasty. And we've got to pause right here because there are a few things that we have to understand about this passage that will help us understand exactly what Jesus is saying. First of all, Jesus isn't an advocate for cannibalism. He's not saying literally come take a bite out of me, literally drink my flesh. Wouldn't that be weird? Jesus is going around healing somebody and someone just comes and takes a bite out of them. I mean, I would, I would look at somebody pretty strangely, if, if not other things, when they came and took a bite out of me while I'm doing something, right? He's not literally saying these things. And there's a lot in this passage that kind of help us understand that this is a, a, a physical illustration of something that's really a spiritual truth. He's been doing this all the way through John already, right? Being born again. He wasn't literally talking about crawling back up in your mama and being born again, right? Nicodemus says that. How can a man be born again, right? Can he enter the womb again? No. Physical illustration of a spiritual truth. Uh, to, the, to the woman at the well, he says that he would be living water. Uh, you know, not talking about literally water that's living, uh, but instead that he would be the one that would satisfy the thirst and longing of her soul. Uh, and here we've got this whole thing uh, with eating and drinking flesh, right? Uh, the same types of things physical idea to present a spiritual truth. Uh, in verse 63, Jesus even makes it even more clear this is not literal. He says that, that the words of the Spirit are life. He says, I'm talking about something spiritual here. He actually goes on and clarifies that. But many people have come to this place to talk about how communion, the Lord's Supper, or, or the Eucharist, as some would say it, um, says that when we take up the Lord's Supper, we're literally eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Uh, if you want a nice word this week to work with people, it's called transubstantiationism. Uh, so take that, throw it out in the middle of a, of a conversation. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. They'll think you're smart. Uh, you know, but that's, that's really all this. Is. There are people that believe this. But there's some reasons why we can say this isn't what he's pointing to. Not only is it not literally uh, his flesh and blood, but also the wording is different. Here he says, whoever eats my flesh, in the Greek that's sarks, 
Uh, but when we look at communion, when we look at the Lord's table, it's the word body that's always used with that, which is a different word in Greek. It's the word soma. So very much different uh, wording there than what's used. Also, we haven't gotten to that point yet, right? The Lord's table is established there during the Passover, uh, the night in which he was betrayed, right? And so we haven't made it that point. So using that illustration to speak to this crowd of Jews would have been useless. They wouldn't have understood what he was talking about, would have had no clue how to connect it. Uh, so we see that that wouldn't work either. Scripture also helps to nullify this because he says, whoever eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood will have life. So in other words, they have eternal life. So if, if that's literally, whoever takes communion then is saved, is what he says. The scripture doesn't back that up. As a matter of fact, when we get to 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, the passage that we often talk to before we partake of the Lord's Supper and communion there, it actually talks about how it's for believers, right? If anyone takes this in an unworthy manner. So in other words, you can take the Lord's Supper every day. You can eat, if you love those little wafers, you can eat them all day long and drink whatever your choice is, your, your Welch's or your wine or whatever, uh, whatever your fruit of the cup is there, uh, fruit of the vine is. You can do it all day long and you're not saved. It doesn't save you from those things. Scripture teaches against that, actually. So we know that that's not what he's talking about. So the question is, is Jesus, what are you really talking about? Why are you telling these people to eat your flesh and drink your blood? And we see Jesus is talking about uh, the, the intimate experience that we can have as we allow ourselves to be to be assimilated with him, right? To become one with him. To become uh, connected with Christ. To join with him through repentance and faith. See, everybody's looking for something in this world. Unfortunately, most of us are looking to the material world for material things to make our life better. To fill the longing and the, and the void that's in our lives. To, to try to drown out that emptiness that so many of us feel. But what we need isn't found in the material world, in material things. What we need is, is the new birth. What we need is living water. What we need is the bread of life. What we need is the body and the blood of Christ. And to come and join together with Christ through repentance and faith. And then all of a sudden, that emptiness now has something to fill it. That void that we couldn't quite put our finger on, now all of a sudden we understand what it is. Because we were created to be united with Christ. Jesus is to our spirit what blood is to our body, right? It's life is what he says. It's life. He's the life. Blood is life of the flesh. Jesus is life of the spirit. In other words, Jesus is God in the flesh. And, and here we see what John the Baptist says, that he's the lamb uh, that takes away the sin of the world, right? Here's what he's talking about. I'm going to be slain for your sin, and if you'll join me in faith, then you will have life. And the Jews here shake their head. They think this is absurd, and they're offended. But you know, people today do the same thing. When you look at someone and say, you're born in sin, when you look at someone and say, the things that you do that go against God offend that holy God, and because of that, you are separated from God, and you can't do anything about it. You can't work hard enough, you can't be good enough, you can't give enough, you can't be a nice enough person to do anything about it. You can go to church your entire life and help everybody you know of and join every civic organization and give all of your money and become destitute and poor for others, and it's not enough to take away even one of those sins. People get offended. You tell me there's nothing I can do about it, right? There's mm -hmm. nothing you can do about it. What can be done is that God out of his love sent Jesus to die for you. And if you put your faith in Jesus, this person that you've never seen personally, he promises you that he will forgive you of your sin, and therefore you will be holy and righteous before God and be able to join him in heaven. That's offensive to people. The gospel message in and of itself is offensive. Because it tells us we can't save ourselves and someone has to do it for us. So anytime you come across someone who is trying to make the gospel softer, more palatable to the world, which unfortunately a large number of our churches and our culture seem to be doing, then what they're really doing is walking away from the gospel itself. Because the gospel is not offensive that we don't see our need for Christ. 
We need to know we've offended God, and we need to be broken by that, right? We talked about that a little bit last week. Blessed are, the, are, are those who are uh, the born spirit. Blessed are those who mourn over their sin. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. All that comes from this idea of realizing that we are an offense to God. To find the offensiveness of the gospel. Jesus here is giving himself, and he's saying, I'm going to give myself in the same way that I gave you those five loaves and two fish. It didn't seem like all that much to begin with, but in the end, it was more than enough. That's how I'm going to give myself. I may not look like a whole lot to you now. I'm just Joseph, the carpenter's son to you now. But there's coming a day when I'm lifted up, when I'm crucified, and I'm dead, dead and buried, and I rise again from the, from the dead, when you're going to realize that I am more than enough. I will satisfy, and I'm the only thing, the only one who can satisfy your soul. I am the only one who can make your cup runneth over. I'm the only one that can give you the abundant life that you really need, not the one in your head that you think you need that's full of a bunch of stuff. That's where he's going with this. And he puts out there for this entire crowd who he is and what he came to do. It's all on full display. And Jesus says here that there are two things or two options. And these are the words of Christ that we see. Two options. Verse 53, if you do not eat this flesh and drink this blood, you have no life. Jesus says, I'll let you choose. One option is you can reject what I'm saying. You can reject me. You can reject my flesh and my blood. You can reject this, this union with me. But if you do, know that you don't have any life in you. Well, I'm alive. Spiritually. You are spiritually dead, and you will never have spiritual life in you if you reject this crisis, what he's saying. We like options. And as much as I don't like this option, this is an option that Christ gives to every person who's ever lived. You can, you can reject me. And we know that while we're here in this place today, there will be people who will die. And according to Scripture, since the way to Christ is narrow, and the way to death and destruction is broad and wide, that a large portion of those people are going to die choosing this option. To not be one with Christ. To not join To not put their faith in Him. To assimilate with Him. But then in verse 54, Jesus goes a step further. He says, if you do eat this flesh and drink this blood, then you have life in you. And then he goes on through all the way up for the, for the next four verses, through verse 58, and kind of tells us what that means. But before we look at that, I, I want to make this as just as clear and plain as well. <coughs> Jesus gives two options. You know why he gives two options? Because there are only two options. That's it. We talk about black and white a lot of times, but we like to live our lives in the gray. There's no gray when it comes to your spiritual life. You are either someone who has accepted Christ as he's presented in Scripture, and you have life, or you're someone who has rejected Christ, and you don't have life, as he says here. There's no neutral. There's no kind of, there's no kind of halfway doing it. It's like someone saying they're kind of pregnant. You either are or you aren't, right? That's it. There's no in between. It's yes or no, black or white. Here he says, you either take me or you don't take me. You take me, you have life. You don't take me, you don't have life. Just that simple cut and dry. There's no other way. There's no other alternatives. Uh, there's no other options. As he was going to say, as we'll read here in the next couple of weeks, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's it. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. That's it. I am the only way. And he says, if you do choose me, he says that that life is an eternal life, right? That's what he says there in verse 54, that it's eternal life. Uh, so that involves more than just really... Uh, the idea of, of living on forever. Because whether you accept him or reject him, your soul is going on forever. It's a matter of whether or not it's going on to eternal life or to eternal death. So we're talking about eternal life. We're talking about uh, the joy, uh, the rewards, uh, the greatness that come along with following God and, and being in his presence. Now, we also see here another reason why we can say this isn't uh, literal, that, that uh, eating his flesh and drinking his blood isn't something literal. Because back in verse 40, Jesus says the eternal life comes from seeing and believing in him, right? So seeing and believing in him must equal eating his flesh and drinking his blood because they both lead to eternal life. They're the same thing, right? So we know he's talking about a spiritual concept here. Uh, he says that you have eternal life. And he goes on to say, I will raise him up, right? I will raise him up the last day. So not only do you have eternal life when you say yes to him, you have a life that eventually is raised to newness. Uh, when we baptize somebody, we talk about being raised to newness of life. The moment you say yes to Christ, you are a new creation in Christ, the scripture tells us. There's a new life. 
Uh, your, that dead spiritual self of yours is now raised to life. And there's literally coming a day physically when that body is going to be raised to meet you uh, in, in heaven, right? Uh, everybody gets resurrected. Everybody, everybody comes out of the grave. Some rise to, to meet uh, those spirits uh, in heaven. Some will be connected for those in hell. And if you want to know more about that, join us on Wednesday night. We're talking about heaven, hell, and Satan. Yes, it was a cheap plug. I'm sorry. Uh, but, <laughs> but that's where Christ is here. He says, I'll resurrect your body. And then he says something that, that just is, is really, really stands out to me. Verse 56 who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. He says, not only do you have eternal life, not only do you have this resurrection to life, but you will abide in me, you will live in me, and I will live in you. Right? We'll be connected, we'll be joined. That's what the work of the Holy Spirit is. Jesus tells the disciples uh, that if he goes away, God will send another, a helper, a paraclete that will come in. Uh, and, and, and will be there as our guide and direct us and will indwell us. The moment we say yes to Christ in faith, the Holy Spirit indwells us. That's when we talk about inviting Christ into your life. We're really saying, let the Holy Spirit live in your life, right? Join through the Spirit. And so he says that. He says, if you do this, if you say yes to me, then the Holy Spirit will dwell in you, right? And you'll live in me and I'll live in you. And we'll guide and direct you. You're always going to get it right, but I'm going to be there with you, right? We're just saying, sanctuary. Sanctuary is the abiding place of God, is really the concept of the idea. For every believer, you're already a sanctuary. But we're saying, God, make me better. Make me holy. Make me, uh, make me, make me righteous. Let me have a life that's prepared for you to live in this body of mine the way that it should be. That's part of what we're seeing when we're seeing that. Another thing that's really interesting about this, this passage here in 54 through 58 is when he says eat and drink, it's in the aorist tense in Greek. Hold your excitement. I know you just got excited about that part. But, uh, what that really means is, is it's punctilio. One time thing. It's a past event. I woke up this morning. There was one point this morning, one exact second this morning when I woke up. I'm not doing it again this morning, right? I'm not waking up again. That time is done. It's over with. I don't do it over and over and over and over and over and over again. Same thing here. When you eat his flesh and drink his blood, it's a one time thing. It's a one time thing. So when you put your faith in Christ, it's one time. It's effective from that point forward, but it only happens once. You don't have to wake up every day and ask God to save you. Every time you sin, you don't have to pray for Jesus to come back into your life and, and turn away from your sin to those things. We confess. We repent. We come back to where we're supposed to be uh, and be who God's called us to be. But we don't have to get saved over and over and over and over again. And this is one of those things that points to it. So Jesus says, here I am. Take me. You'll have life. Reject me. You don't. And then John shows us something that, that I really want to spend the rest of our time looking at. You know, he showed us the words of Christ, but now we can see the, the, the ways of people right here. What were their reactions to what Jesus said, to what he did? And we find that the first reaction there uh, in verse 60. I believe that is. Let me turn my page here. Um, in verse uh, 60, uh, it says, there, Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand? Now, the idea of who can understand is really this idea of, of, of this is difficult. Like, how, who can do this? Who can practice this? Uh, how can this be done? This is harsh, in other words. And by the time we get down to verse 66, it says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then after Jesus said, Jesus, what you're saying is hard. <coughs> what you're saying is, is, is offensive. What you're saying is, is it's something that we really weren't expecting, and so... We're going to reject you. And that's the first response, is a response of rejection. A response of rejection. Now, in 24 hours, these folks have gone from those who were trying to make Jesus their king on the mountainside because he fed them some, some bread and fish. They go from singing his praises and looking for him and chasing him across the lake to Capernaum so they can see him do more things and saying, show us what to do and give us this bread, doing all those things. So all of a sudden, now they're complaining and abandoning him. And once he, it wasn't the hardness of the message, but it was the hardness of their heart that caused them to reject Christ. The faith and repentance that Jesus is talking about was more than, than they were willing to give. It was further than they were willing to go, right? They weren't willing to accept and do what Christ was saying. And so they say, Jesus, if you're not going to be who we think you should be, we don't want anything to do with you. 
Now, the word disciple here is kind of fooling to us. In our modern day, when we think about disciples, we think about like the 12. We think about the apostles. We think about those who, who are believers. But the idea of a disciple at this point is someone who just followed another person's teaching. And these people were literally following Christ, right? They followed him across the lake. They followed him up on the mountainside. These are people who were following him because they were like, we kind of like what he's doing. We want to see what he's doing next. And we're spending our life kind of following his way. But they weren't people who truly put their faith in Christ yet. And we know that because they walked away. John would say in 1 John, John, in 1 John he would say, uh, they, they left us because they were not of us. In other words, they hung around us, but eventually when push came to shove, and it was a time to decide whether they had faith or not, they left because they didn't have faith. Same thing here. They said, who can listen to this? Who can hear this? Who can understand this? Not because it was complicated, because it wasn't what they expected, because it was objectionable. Scripture tells us that the gospel is foolishness to the world, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. Paul says to the Corinthian church, we know that when we preach the gospel, people are going to look at us like we got a third eye. This is going to sound like the most foolish, dumb thing ever to follow some guy who was crucified on the cross. The Jews are going to struggle with it because they see a Messiah as someone who's coming and reigning as a political king, not someone who's, who's dead. The Greeks are going to look at it and say that it's foolishness because uh, power and, and, and being elite was a big deal for, for, for the Greeks. It didn't make sense to them even uh, semantically uh, why you would even preach this message. But if God takes that message of the gospel, and some people are going to hear it and they're going to believe. They're going to see the wisdom and the power of God for them. These people weren't those folks. They saw it as foolishness, right? And it says they left them. Where did they go? They went back to their lives that they had before they had this encounter with Christ. They went back to their old way of doing things. They went back to their old way of thinking. And for so many people, when they're presented uh, with, with Christ the way he is in Scripture, they were okay with them until all of a sudden Jesus says, you've got to commit, you've got to do something. And then they go back to doing what they were doing before, which is always funny to me. Everybody comes seeking after Christ because something's happening in their life, it seems like. Something's going on. They realize they need something more than what they got. But when Christ becomes too much for them to handle, all of a sudden they go back to the mess they just left and say, oh, I'd rather have this mess than Jesus. As soon as Jesus was no longer a source that met their personal desires, they left. When he demanded that they acknowledge their, their spiritual bankruptcy, when they, he, he demanded that they mourn over their sin, that they would hunger and thirst for righteousness, they would deny themselves, they would take up their cross, they would follow him, they walked away. When he says, if you want to save your life, you must lose it. And if you lose your life, you will save it. They just shake their head. So we don't want to do that. Some of them leave hurt, some of them leave angry, some of them leave disappointed, but all of them that leave and don't put their faith in Christ, they're all leaving as dead men walking, as we would say. They're all leaving as people who are still spiritually dead because they're rejecting Christ. And I think there are a lot of people who have no problem looking at Jesus and saying, he's a good teacher, you know, he's this guy that shows us how to love and have great compassion for the world. Some people see him as a, as a social reformer or some, some giver of happiness. But when Jesus presents himself, as he does in Scripture, as one who refuses to tolerate sin. When Jesus says, go and sin no more. When, when Jesus says, you've got to follow me and put your faith in me as I am, or else you don't have life, then all of a sudden, uh, they don't want to have anything to do with him anymore. When all of a sudden Jesus says, I'm not just this one who loves and hugs and kisses on babies and kids and makes you feel good, but I'm also the one who will judge you in the last days. They don't have anything to do with that, Jesus. So there's rejection. But that's not the only response. We also see reception. Now in 60, verse 67, Jesus said to the twelve, so those we often call the, the, the disciples and the apostles, uh, do you also want to go away? 
But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So we see a response of rejection, but we also see a response of reception. Peter, good old bold Peter, speaks for the entire group. We know that because it says we, speaking in plural here. As a spokesman of the group, here's what we have to say, all right? Now, I'll tell you, these disciples have been listening to the same thing that the rest of the crowd has been listening to. They have seen Jesus healing. They've seen him performing miracles, just like the crowd. I can promise you they don't understand all of this. The way we know is as you keep on reading, all the way up until Jesus gets arrested and, and tried and hung on the cross, they still didn't understand that Jesus was coming to give his life for the world as a ransom. They're fighting about it. They're trying to stop people from doing it. They don't understand it. So they didn't understand every little part of this. But they knew enough for Peter to say, we're with you. We choose you. We're staying. We want you. Jesus, to whom shall we go? Nobody else has the words of life. You're it, Jesus. Just, we've got hopes. We've got a lot of hopes. We have very high hopes. And all of our hopes are in you. Without you, we don't have any hope. That's it. That's what he says. Uh, we receive you. There's no one else like you. There's no one to satisfy the longing of our hearts. And then we see something that's really interesting. He says, we have come to believe. So he's admitting there's a point. He's put his faith in Christ. We've come to believe. We have faith in you. That you are the Christ of some living God. He also says, to whom shall we go? It's this idea of faithfulness. Like we believed in you. Where are we going to go now? We have no one else that, that we could believe in. There's nothing else that's going to do it. There's nobody else that's going to meet our needs. We are going to be faithful. We are going to continue to commit our lives to you. And that's the answer for those who will receive Christ. We put our faith in him. Then we commit our lives to following him. No matter how ridiculous it may seem to the world, no matter if we understand everything or not, we're committed to this man, Jesus Christ, and to his way, and say, you know what? We put our faith in you that if you're not it, then we're just all doomed. You've got to be it. Then look at what Jesus says in verse 7. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you the twelve, and one of you is a devil? Remember, John is writing this later on. He's coming back and writing down things led to the Holy Spirit. So he's able to write verse 71. He says, He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who betrayed him, being one of the twelve. And we see a third choice of how to, to react to this, these two options of accept, accepting Christ and rejecting him. And I want to tell you, this is the one that scares me. <coughs> this is the one that I'm really afraid we see more of than not. It's the choice of deception. I mean, here are folks who've been saying, how can I be fed by God? How do we do the works of God? How do we get this bread of life, this living water? How can we be born again? And the answer is only found in Jesus. But there are some who are going to say, yeah, I'm going to keep following this Jesus guy around. I'm going to keep going to church. I'm going to keep being involved. I'm going to keep giving. I'm going to keep going through the motions. I'm going to keep on saying yes and nodding my head and doing all these things to where everybody thinks that I'm following Christ, but in my heart, in my head, I know that I really don't. In my heart, in my head, when he says things that I disagree with, I think that I'm right and that he's wrong. When he tells me to go do something and I don't feel like doing it, I just don't do it because I really didn't follow him that way. I'm not willing to follow him to the death like the other 11 are. And you may never be like Judas and get to the point where you're selling Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver, but you sell him out. You sell not by choosing the ways of the world and your own ways and other things and other gods in your life, little G. Instead of choosing him. I want to tell you that right now, as we're in this place, Sunday morning, churches are filled with people that are living this third choice out. To where no one would ever know around them that they're not really following Christ all the way. They're just kind of hanging on to him, hoping that if they go to church enough, if they say enough about Jesus, if they learn more scripture here or there, or bring their kids to church or do whatever, that God's going to bless them and lift them into heaven. But Jesus says, that's not it. You take me and you get life, or you reject me and you don't. This isn't the middle ground. This isn't the gray area that so many of us want to live our lives in. And statistically speaking, just to get as real as I can, that means there's a good number of us in this place today that are in this category. <coughs> I 
Jesus in Revelation says, I spit you out of my mouth because you're lukewarm. Be hot or be cold. Yesterday, Candy was sharing with us a burden she had on her heart for, for a young girl that she's kind of befriended. Um, already graduated, graduated last year. And they spent a lot of time talking back and forth and those things. And, and the girl very openly admits she doesn't want to have anything to do with Jesus. She's cool, Candy. She's like, you can do your Jesus thing all you want to, but I don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. <coughs> and I think I kind of shocked Candy last night when I said, I'm glad she said that to you. So because now she's not doing what so many people do, which is to pretend to love Jesus and, and follow the crowd and do whatever they got to do around the right set of people to look good. Mm-hmm. Instead, now we know <coughs> that she's cold. And we can keep trying to spark the fire to build a fire there. We can keep on sharing and sharing and sharing and sharing and have her not just give us the right answers because she thinks it's what we want to hear. And there are too many people who call themselves believers who are living lives in a certain way around spiritual people, around church people, around those that they want them to think that they are following Jesus, but in their own personal life, they look like the devil. He says, one of you is the devil. The word is accuser. So literally, Judas is going to be the one that accuses Jesus by going and, 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 and turning on him to the Pharisees. But also, devil means enemy of God, right? One of you is not for me, you're against me. You may not be thinking in your head, I'm against God, but anytime you're not choosing Christ, you're choosing the opposite of Christ. Choosing the devil. There are some folks that, that are all about the religious practices if we can just take communion, if we can just go to church, if we can just give, if we can just go through these things. A lot of us live our life that, in a way that really mimics uh, the Roman Catholic Church. If I can just go through these seven or eight things over and over and over and over and over and over again in my life, then God gives me enough grace that I'll make it to heaven. Jesus says, there's one way to get grace, that's through me. You can take all the communions you want, you can give all the money you want, you can go to church, you can say as many prayers as you want. If you don't accept me, you don't have life. He was very clear about that. And so then, since that at work, we take the word of God, we try to twist it and manipulate it and make it fit what we think. You know, Jesus, you say this, but this is 2021. We don't think like that anymore. We think this way. So therefore, this must be right and you must be wrong. I wish you would just update yourself. I wish you get a modern look, Jesus. I posted on Facebook the other day, for those of you that follow social media, church in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, if I had to pick a spot on the map of the United States that I consider the belt buckle of the Bible belt, it would be Nashville, Tennessee. It is right in the middle of the Bible belt. It's literally where the SBC headquarters are. Uh, if, there is, if, if, if you have not explored Nashville, some of y'all go and just go to Opry Mills and those things. If you ain't ever explored Nashville, go explore Nashville and you see it's not a church in every corner. It's a church on about every other driveway. I mean, there's churches everywhere. And this church comes out and the pastor through social media essentially comes out and says, the Bible isn't the Word of God. It just shows us how people responded to God, how different people lived their lives. That's it. Christian. It was the label is called Christian pastor. Not a Christian. If you're not following Christ, you can't be a Christian. It's just not a label you put on. And one of the reasons why people look at the church the way they do is there's so many people that fall in this, ag- this category of deception that claim the name of Christ and live totally different because they're not really truly following Christ, and the world looks at them and says, if that's what Christianity is about, I don't want to have anything to do with it. If your Christianity is nothing more than a Jesus of America because you want to make it all about nationalism, I don't want to have anything to do with that. If your Jesus is just about who you hate and who you don't want to be around, I don't want to have anything to do with that. If your Jesus has a mouth like that and watches the things that you watch and does the things you do, then why would I do anything different? I'm already doing that. I want to tell you, we're going to to hit this in a few weeks. This this part isn't a shameless plug for Wednesday night. It's just coming up. We're going to talk about the different levels of reward and punishment, really, that come at the end of this life. Scripture tells us that those who are sitting in church week after week after week and hearing the gospel week after week after week and got the word of God being presented week after week after week are going to be held more accountable. It is better for you to have not heard or even not be born, as Jesus says in one place in Scripture. So I'll call you out today. Be hot or be cold. Stop playing with the name if you're not really for Christ. We'd rather know that you lost. Stop playing the games. Because Jesus knows, and one day you're going to stand in front of him, and he's going to say, either you have life or you don't. You accepted me or you didn't. And we already know what's going to happen. 
See, some people are going to say, did we prophesy in your name and preach and cast out demons? And did we do all these works in your name? Well, that's great, but you didn't know me. He says, depart from me, for you never knew me. Not that you never did stuff for me. You never knew me. So today, we have to make that decision. Just like this crowd had to make the decision, just like Peter had to make the decision, just like the 12 had to make their decisions, some chose Christ, one rejected Christ in 12, right? Some of the crowd accepts Christ, some of the crowd rejects Christ. We have to choose what we're going to do. Today, maybe you're in one of those spots other than receiving Christ. Maybe... In all reality, you've been putting Christ off, you've been rejecting, maybe you've been playing the game, maybe you've been trying to look good, maybe you've been doing things around the surface, maybe you've been going through the motions and hoping they're enough. Then today Jesus says, it's time to get things right. See, that's what we call grace. That's what we call mercy. Because God looks at us and says, you're a pretender, but you can be the real thing. Turn away from your sins and put your faith in it. And then you'll have a real abundant life. Maybe today you need to do that. Just time, in just a moment we'll have time for response. I'll invite you to come down and talk to me. We'll walk you through what Scripture says we have to do to be saved. Some of you maybe just need some time to examine yourselves. We we'll talk about that with the Lord's Supper a lot, right? Communion a lot. And let a man examine himself. Maybe today is just a day of examination. Are you real? Is your faith real? Or have you just been doing the church thing so long that you fooled yourself? Anybody ever fooled themselves before? You ever had your mind play tricks on you? You ever seen things that weren't there? Some of, some of you, I think, spiritually are doing that today. You're letting your spiritual eyes play tricks on you and say, yes, I'm saved, when you know in all reality you're really not. Maybe today's the day to get that straight. Some of you have truly received Christ, truly accepted Christ. But maybe it's that commitment side of things that we see Peter saying here, you know, to whom shall we go, right? We're committing ourselves to you. Maybe there's some struggles going on in your commitment to Christ. Maybe you're taking your eyes off of him. Maybe you're kind of straying some here or there. Maybe there's someone in your life that God's laid in your heart that's doing that. You just want to come and have some time of prayer. Come and do it. This is a time for you to deal with whatever it is that God's put in your heart. And I pray that's what would happen today. Father, I thank you. I thank you that in this particular passage of John chapter 6, you make it very clear to the entire world who Jesus is and what he's done. You make it very clear as to the two choices that we all have. And you say, you're not going to force us, you're not going to make us choose Christ, but if we don't, then we choose the consequences. And Father, we see very clearly in this passage that you don't send people to hell, people choose to go to hell by rejecting Christ. And Father, it's my prayer that no one who, who's here today or who would, would hear this sermon we choose to reject Christ and go to hell. But today will be a day of salvation for them. Today will be a day in which uh, the Holy Spirit convicts in such a way and draws in such a way. And they see their need for Christ. Not their need for a church, not their need just to, to be better. But their need to surrender their lives to Him. And Father, I pray that happens today. Pray for those who, who have already made that decision that, that today will be a day of strengthening, whatever that may mean in their life. Be a day of getting some things in order. It'd be a day of, of encouraging and equipping. And Father, if nothing else, it'd be a day in which we're reminded of what Christ has done for us. So that the gratitude we have in our hearts would grow. So that the hands and feet that you've given us to serve you and to serve others would become more active. And Father, so that those lips you've given us to share the gospel with would share freely, regardless of whether or not we're worried about it offending somebody or not. Father, we pray during this time of invitation that you would be with us, that you would guide us, that you would strengthen us. We pray all this in Jesus' name.